We continue this series in the letter of 1 John today with two passages, one from 1 John chapter 4, verses 13 through 21, and chapter 5, verses 13 through 17. Listen again now for the word of God. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love of God that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and their sisters. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the boldness we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the requests made of him. If you see your brother or sister committing what is not a mortal sin, You will ask, and God will give life to such a one, to those whose sin is not mortal. There is a sin that is mortal, and I do not say that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that is not mortal. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Boldness in the Christian life is the theme for the sermon this morning. Boldness in the Christian life. Think how hard it is to be bold with all the bad things that are happening in our lives and in our world these days. And we wonder if God is ever going to come and fix them all. We're just waiting for God to come so we can be bold in the Christian life. It's like the story of the teacher who came into class one day and she asked the students to sit down at their desks. But one little boy, Johnny, stood by his desk with his stomach sticking out. She said, Johnny, you need to sit down. And he just stood there staring at the clock on the wall, never sat down. She finally went ahead and taught the class. Toward the end of the class, she was frustrated. Johnny, why are you standing there like that with your stomach sticking out? Well, it's like this, teacher. I came to school this morning. I had an awful tummy ache, and I went to the school nurse, and she gave me some medicine for it. And then she said, you're just going to have to stick it out until noon, she said. Stick it out. You all have to think about that one now. And that's what I'm doing. That's the way we feel sometimes, isn't it? We we don't know when things are going to change, and we just have to kind of stick it out a little bit longer. Maybe that's what the people who heard First John's letter were thinking. We're just going to have to stick it out until Jesus' return. Or it's what we say to our children after Thanksgiving is over and they're just expecting Christmas to go ahead and come. They're just going to have to stick it out a little bit longer. Imagine how hard it is to wait when things seem sort of de- down and bad in our lives. We feel a little down sometimes, maybe even a little depressed, don't we? One night on a Saturday night, Garrison Keillor did one of his Guy Noir routines. You've heard it, I'm sure, many times. Hi, 
I'm Guy Noir. And I'm feeling a little down tonight here in St. Paul, where it's always dark this time of year, even though I'm happy and thankful that the Apostle Paul traveled here and founded this city, well, I'm still feeling a little down. The other day I took a depression test to see how depressed I really was and I made a perfect score. So, feeling a little down. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Is that your problem? The reason you can't have boldness in the Christian life is because you're feeling a little down, you're not sure. And despite First John's attempts, repeated attempts to cheer you up, John keep, pe keeps picking up the same theme that we've heard before over and over. He keeps playing it again in symphonic sounds, smooth ones, like an orchestra blending the tune with a, a kind of theological counterpoint with the world. And what do we hear in those arpeggios and chords? We hear the whispering voice of 1 John saying, quit worrying about the future. Quit worrying about what is happening into your life because God is with you. God will be with you to the very end of the age. But we're not so sure about that, are we? We, we aren't sure that God is actually going to be with us. And so we're fearful. Uh, and yet... God says, don't be afraid. And some of us say, well, I don't need God to overcome fear. I, uh, I can overcome the present fear. I can overcome anxiety about the future. I don't really worry about that too much. And the truth is, though, that fear is actually a good thing. It actually keeps us out of trouble. Several years ago, I was lecturing at a medical conference in Aspen, and and part of the conference involved going and skiing in the afternoon, and our younger son David was there. Mr. Let's Try It, and we went up on a blue slope. I'm not a very good skier in the first place. It was a little scary. I thought there are no seat belts on this thing. What is this? And then we come to one of those tubes, you know, like in the Olympics where they ski up like this and like that. And David says, let's try it. I said, David, I'm not getting anywhere near that thing. Uh, that morning, I had been lecturing on the brain and talking about the prefrontal cortex, which is the brain's parent, and the limbic system, which is the brain's teenager. And it sometimes fights with us when we try to make decisions in our lives, no matter how old or young we are. So he went on down like that, and then I came. I said, I'm just going to go around, and I came to this ramp. You know that thrill of victory, agony of defeat ramp where they ski off into the air and prefrontal cortex it says, don't get near that thing. And the limbic says, let's try it. And back and forth, well, I hit it and I'm flying in the air 30 feet above the ground going, this is amazing. And then realizing, oh no, I have to go down. And I'm a garage sale down the side of the mountain. It's absolutely amazing. I didn't break something. Nothing was left except a ski pole, and I stood up and I said, yes! And Dad, David said, Dad, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And we bonded at that moment. And then I realized it was the stupidest thing he'd ever seen. You know those t-shirts that say, no fear on the front? Well, the back should say, no sense either. There's a part of our brain called the amygdala that is in the limbic system that is for recognizing the fear before you. It's the fear, flight, fight part of our brain, and it's been there for millennia because ancestors had saber-toothed tigers in their face or a big snake, and they had to react quickly before they could even think con consciously. So fear is a good thing. It keeps us out of trouble, but, well, sometimes we overreact. Harold Koenig, who teaches at Duke University Medical Center, has done a lot of study on this, and he says that the overactivation of the hypothalamus and the amygdala actually decreases the effectiveness of the immune system. Uh, well, if you're running for your life from a tiger, you're not too worried about catching a cold, you're just running it for your life, but the problem is we overreact with this amygdala to other things that are not tigers, that's a different color of skin, or it's a different political ideology, or it's the name of a certain politician that causes us to have a, an overactive visceral reaction. 
And that's what gets us in trouble. Yes, fear is a good thing to keep us out of trouble, but fear can actually do psychic damage to us if someone who means us no harm causes us to overreact. Fear, says the author of 1 John, can lead to punishment. It's almost a self-inflicted hell that we bring upon ourselves, particularly if we grew up in a church that emphasized hell, fire, and brimstone over and over again. Never could quite understand the grace of God if you grew up with that. Gary Burge, who used to teach at Wheaton College, once asked his students to write an essay on which was more important to them in their lives, which held more sway, the threat of God's law on the one hand or the wonder of God's grace on the other. And over 90% admitted that it was the threat of God's law, that, that God's unmerited grace was not foremost on their minds, that most of their lives, they admitted, these young evangelical men and women, that most of their lives was worrying about pleasing God, getting God's favor, doing good things to get God's favor. And Burge said, that's not what Christianity's about, and you could have heard a pin drop. They said they'd never really heard it this way. They had believed that, that God's law was what was important and they needed to follow it and they were trying to please God, not realizing that they could please God but only in response to God's unmerited love of them. Do not be afraid, says the author of 1 John. Be bold in the Christian life before God because of the unmerited grace that we have in Jesus Christ. So you see, John's remedy is something called love. In fact, it's called perfect love. It is so perfect that it casts out fear. You see, the opposite of love is not hate, it's fear. And perfect love casts out fear. And how do we find that perfect love? Well, not by wallowing in our things that bring us down, all the awful things that happen in our life, but I I abiding in God and how allowing God to abide in us. First John says this over and over in this letter. Abide in God and allow God to abide in you. And when you do, you experience soteria, which is the word for salvation that means health, wholeness, peace, harmony, not just for this sort of Greek idea of the soul, but the Hebrew idea of the soul, which means all of who you are, mind, body, spirit. You begin to feel it in your whole life when perfect love casts this fear out. It casts it out like a, a bucket of dirty water that has been infecting your life all life long. Harold Koenig, I mentioned earlier at Duke University Medical Center, has shown in over 500 quantitative statistical, statistical studies across the country that people who frequently are involved in religion and spirituality actually have more mentally and physically healthy lives than those who don't. Wow. Well, I think, I think it's because they are experiencing perfect love. Those who come and worship and are involved in Bible studies and prayer, you're experiencing perfect love. You're getting close to it, which then casts out fear and makes you a healthier person. But he goes on. I heard him do this in Grand Rounds at a medical center uh, in, in Dallas. It was amazing. He said, religion provides purpose and meaning for our lives. It provides psychological integration when negative things happen, like the loss of a limb or the loss of a, of a loved one. Religion and spirituality provide hope and motivation to go on uh, after cancer. Uh, it, it provides role models for dealing with suffering. It provides guidance for decision-making in the healing process. It provides answers to the ultimate questions of life, like where did I come from, why am I here, and where am I going? Questions that become louder and louder in moments of stress and pain. But there's more. Why do religion and spirituality and those who practice it frequently bring uh, people into a healthier place? Well, here's what you get out of it. And he named all of these things. 
Those who participate in religion and spirituality on a regular basis have less instances of stroke, less heart disease, lower cholesterol, the wounds close and heal more quickly, better immune endocrine function, and lower mortality from cancer. Wow, why isn't everybody in church with all of that information? And why is it true? I think it's true because those who are participating in regular religion and spirituality are actually experiencing the perfect love of God. And it helps you as a whole person, body, mind, spirit, to be healthier. Now, why am I telling you all this? I mean, you all are here. Most of you are here every week. I'm telling you because you have family and friends who are anxious and hurting and need this news. And I want you to share it with everyone you know, every single person. That's how you love your brother and sister, by helping them begin to understand that participation in this kind of community can actually help them overcome the anxiety they are experiencing. If you saw a person dying of hunger and you had food, wouldn't you want to share it? And if you saw one dying of thirst and you have water, wouldn't you want to give them some water? So, you and I are called to be bold in the Christian life because the perfect love has cast the fear out of us and now we need to share this good news with others, the good news of a God who loves you and me more than we could ever imagine. To this God be all honor and blessing and glory and praise from this day forth and forevermore.